Hey listeners, it's Jana. Welcome back to Grief Out Loud. I wanted to let you know that today's episode references self-harm, substance use, and a description of a suicide attempt. If you or someone you know needs support, please reach out. Here in the United States, you can call 988 or text HELLO to 741741. One of our commitments with Grief Out Loud is to highlight the stories that often don't get shared, even in the grief world. Grief can be lonely, even in the best of circumstances. So when your story doesn't match the dominant narrative, or when you can't find an article, an essay, or even a podcast episode that reflects your experience, that loneliness and isolation get exacerbated. This is why today's guest, Dr. Jennifer Vrend, reached out to me. Jen's ex-husband, Jesse, died after many years of struggling with mental health and alcohol use, and she couldn't find any stories about how to grieve when you're the ex and what to do with the confusing swirl of what it's like when someone you loved and liked and respected changed so much in the years before they died. So she decided to tell hers in the hopes that someone else could feel less alone. Jen is a licensed clinical child and adolescent psychologist and mom to her son, Nick, who she references in our conversation. She's also the co-host of her own podcast, The Coping Toolbox. Okay, here's our conversation. Jen, uh, welcome to Grief Out Loud. It's always exciting to me to have someone on the show who has emailed me after being a listener to say, hey, I have a story and I'd like to tell it. So thank you for reaching, for listening, for reaching out and for agreeing to be on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really, uh, I've been listening to you for a long time now, so I'm looking forward to this. Tell us a little bit about the different roles that you hold in this world. So I think my most important role probably would be being a single mom. I'm the mom to a 15 year old and I hadn't expected to be uh, a single and lone parent for such a long time, but uh, life just kind of goes the way it goes. So I do have a 15 year old. I, I have a partner now, I'm in a relationship and that partner actually we live separately. So, and he has two kids of his own. In terms of my family, my, the rest of my family life, I'm the middle of five kids. So I have a fairly large family. And for work life, I have a mental health clinic that we started just before the pandemic. So we actually had to close down a month after we opened, but we have been able to keep that going. So that's been uh, been helpful for us. And then within my clinic, each of us has our own individual private practice. So my private practice involves me working with child, children and adolescents and with all sorts of different mental health issues. Uh, several months into the pandemic, one of my friends who's a child psychologist asked about starting a podcast, which at the time I hardly even knew what a podcast was, but I said, okay, sure, <laughs> why don't we do this? Um, we don't really make, well, we don't make any money, actually it costs us money to run the podcast, but the idea behind it is just being able to serve more people. We often work one-on-one -on -one or small groups, and so the podcast is a way of us being able to get information out there. I've gotten more into giving talks uh, lately and I'm finding that really fascinating. So being able to talk about all sorts of different subjects and different levels too. So a little bit with the media and some with the federal government and RCMP here in Canada, and then also just smaller groups for talks. I do talks with schools and the bereavement group here in, in Ottawa where I live. And I think just being able to, to fill all sorts of different work roles. In addition to all of those roles as a mom and a partner and a mental health clinician, grief's been a part of your life for a long time. And you were 19 when your best friend died of suicide. And then in a really short number of years, you experienced the death of your mom from cancer in 2016 and your ex-partner, Jesse, in 2020. I know today we're really going to focus on the complicated layers of grief for your ex-partner, but is there anything you want to share with us about your mom or your best friend? Yeah, I think just it's been fascinating to me how differently grief impacts us. And, you know, I, I talked I, again, I've started to do more talks on grief and just how individual the experience is and also depending on who it was that passed away in your relationship with that person, how different it can be even for the same person. So when my best friend passed away at the time I was 19, he died very tragically by suicide. And I was very optimistic and, you know, I was, I didn't struggle at all with mental health issues at that point in my life. And I, 
I really just thought, you know, if you're sad, you go for a run or you go play hockey or, you know, you just make the sadness go away. And I didn't really get how hard it is to deal with depression. And obviously my friend did struggle with that. And I think for me at that age, it, it really, when he passed away, it made me feel as though I could understand depression a lot better. And I, I did kind of struggle myself with mood after his passing. And so it really kind of changed how I saw things. The other thing for me at that point is I was quite religious growing up and it really created a, a crisis of faith because it was a death by suicide. So challenging in, in very like all of those different aspects. And then with my mom, I was quite a bit older, obviously, when my mom passed away. And with her, we knew she was going to die. It was terminal cancer and it was her second diagnosis. And so she'd been given a fairly short period to live. And it, she did pass away much more quickly than we expected. But it was interesting because in some ways I thought anticipatory grief and just being able to know that it's coming could help, but I don't know. And I think it really depends on the person and it's just, regardless, it's difficult, right? And so we knew that she was gonna pass away, but that knowledge, it didn't really help in a lot of ways because you just don't know how hard it's gonna be. And you don't really want to imagine what it's gonna be like afterwards. So challenging in its own way. And the other piece with my mom was, she was just such a, she played such a pivotal role in our family. So. When my best friend passed away, I had my family's support. When my mom passed away, it really was, it affected my whole family so much. And it was interesting because it was hard to lean on family because everyone was going through so much grief. And unfortunately for me at that point, there wasn't a whole lot of grief and room for grief in my relationship either because my relationship wasn't strong. And so, you know, not having those, those strong supports in place, I think really made that experience challenging. Yeah, going back to the idea that there's grieving the person and then we are a person in our context and what's going on in our context can have a huge impact on how we feel supported or don't feel supported or what we have access access to in our grief. And I had to laugh because when you said, yeah, if you're depressed, you go for a run or you just play hockey, that might be the most Canadian thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely was naive at the time, but it was just that's what felt right for me. <laughs> so you alluded a little bit to the reality that when your mom died in 2016, your relationship with your ex-partner, Jesse, was in a tumultuous place. And I just wondered what feels important to share about the history of your relationship with Jesse? I think probably the thing I would I think is maybe the most important is just how much I loved him. And I think it has been really hard for me because we did separate and sort of this idea that if you separate from someone, if you leave that person that, you know, you may no longer love that person. And for me, and I remember having this conversation with Jesse when we separated and saying that I, I love you and I will always love you but no longer feeling in love with him. And that part, I think was really challenging for me. And um, the other thing with the relationship with Jesse, I, I mean, I felt extremely loved by him as well. And I don't know, it's a love that I'm not sure that I will feel again. I think it was, we met when we were 20 and um, you know, we, we just, it was a very naive love and we're just, we had our whole futures ahead of us. And the idea of, you know, being together and having children and watching our kids grow up and having grandchildren and all of those things, they were all on the plate. And I just, because we separated and then because he passed away, there seems to be such a shadow. And I th think it's really hard. This is one of the reasons I wanted to speak about this is just, there was so much love and so many good things that happened. And the Jesse I knew before he got so ill was a beautiful human being. He was a mental health nurse and he loved helping people and he was such a kind hearted person. And I really do feel like that gets that can get shadowed by by a death when it is through addictions or suicide or something, something challenging like that. He said you were 20 when you met. How how did you meet? So I it was in university and uh, he, so I was actually living at that time, a number of my housemates were nurses and he was in the nursing program. Uh, at one point, I think there was three out of my four housemates were dating three out of his four <laughs> housemates or something like that. And uh, yeah, we connected. And like I say, I, it was a, it was only a year actually after my friend had passed away. And I think I was still kind of trying to find myself and I was still struggling and he was just, he was so understanding and so thoughtful. And, and I think in a lot of ways really helped me to work through some of the, the challenging things that I was working through. 
So in a sense, Jesse was there as a big support for that first grief of your friend's death. And but then things really changed by the time your mom died in 2016. And how did th- things sort of, I was going to say evolve, but maybe devolve is a better way to talk about that. And I think maybe both, right? Like evolved for for a long period of time. And you know, we met, like I say, when I when I we I was twenty, and we finished university together. We actually moved to Rhode Island and did some work in the states for a little while, and then we moved to Nova Scotia. That's where I did my PhD. And you know, we had a really wonderful life when we got married. We actually got married on a tall ship, and it floated around the Halifax Harbor, and it just seemed so picturesque now when I think of it just being on the tall ship floating around the (laughs) harbor and you know dancing to the music into the night. Uh, My son was born, he was born in 2009. I think that's when things you know in hindsight I think things did start to get more challenging not long before my son was born. My my um, husband at that time was he was in a he worked he worked in mental health and it was also some forensic stuff and he got injured at work and I think hurt his back and it was sort of, I don't know if he's on pain medication or what happened, but that sort of started uh, what became more and more challenges. They were just small to begin with. They weren't, wasn't huge things, but they became bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. And I think I had this, this idea in my head that, you know, I was in school, we had a young child, uh, you know, he was kind of struggling with some mental health challenges and I just kept thinking, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. We'll get to a point where, you know, I'll be done school and he'll, he'll be functioning better and our child will be a little bit older and it's going to get better. And I think I had this idea of our love is so strong that we can get through anything. You know, it, it seemed like it was kind of going in the right direction. It was kind of ups and downs like any relationship. And then in 2015, that's when my mom was diagnosed for the second time with, with cancer. And at that time, we were told she would have probably about three years to live. But uh, as you said, she died within a year. And so I think that's when, for me, it really became more apparent. I, I really needed support from Jesse and his his drinking had really escalated. And, you know, there was a lot more alcohol involved. And yeah, a lot of it is hindsight now. But in the moment, I wasn't really realizing how sick we were becoming. And with alcoholism there's there's this the way it's it's like a vortex that's sucking everyone in and his challenges really were affecting me and i just had in like my mindset very much at the time was if i just do more if i love more if i love harder um if i work harder if we make more money like i just kept thinking there was something i could do that would make things better um and things didn't uh they didn't get better they got more and more challenging over time and how did you come to the decision to leave after hearing you say like you're somebody who just puts in more work and puts in more work. Yeah. So that was, that was really hard for me. Uh, I think anybody, um, hopefully anybody would say if if you marry someone, you're not expecting to divorce that person or to leave that person. And for me, I think, especially being a, a psychologist, I really felt I can't leave because of addictions or depression or anxiety or any of these mental health reasons. But as I said, so we, my mom passed away and it was actually on my son's seventh birthday. It was February of 2016. And I had talked to my mom about a month before she passed away and, and she had worries about our relationship. She was quite concerned about how happy I was. And I remember I actually, it was New Year's Eve when we, we stayed up and we stayed up till late in the morning or early hours of the morning. And uh, I promised her that I would find happiness and I didn't know how or where or what that would look like. But I remember saying that and thinking, okay, this like, I really need to make sure that I find a way to be happy. And whether that means staying with Jesse or not, I didn't know at that time. Initially, there was so much grief and I was kind of at a loss and a, I was really struggling with, like I say, the kind of finding room for my grief in our relationship that was already so, so, so ill. And Jesse, just a few months after my mom passed away, he went into a depressive episode and he needed to go off work and he kind of was working part-time at the time and i just felt so much pressure to be the one making money and and looking after things financially and uh and i i think i was growing resentful because it was sort of like this is my time to grieve and i need this and i and jesse was such a beautiful wonderful person and he would have wanted to do anything for me but i think because of his illness he wasn't able to and I just, I felt very alone in the relationship. 
And things kind of progressed that way um, for the next year or so. And we had been talking about separation. And I remember having in my head, I didn't want to make any big decisions within the first year. And, you know, I, I don't know why after a year it would make any difference. But in my head, it was just sort of, you know, I need to, you know, be on solid ground and, and at least for the next year, I'm, I'm not going to make any of these big decisions. And then it was the summer of 2017. And um, our relationship was was very ill at that point. And I myself was not functioning well. And in no way was I a saint. And, you know, and, and Jesse wasn't functioning well. And we had a young child in the home, her son would have been eight at that point. And I I remember getting a text from him or no he we I had put our son to bed and then we I was leaving to go to the gym and the gym was sort of my way of coping my coping mechanism at that point and he said something to me along the lines of have a nice life Jennifer and he typically didn't call me Jennifer unless he was angry or upset and I remember kind of thinking like oh like should I stay home should does he need like consoling does he need me and I remember thinking no like I really need this for me I was seeing a therapist at the time who was really helping me to kind of try and set boundaries so I went off to the gym and I got to the gym and I was sitting in the parking lot and I had a text from Jesse and the text said goodbye you spectacular asshole and it's so interesting to me because it's so different from the Jesse I knew and the Jesse I married, who was this beautiful, wonderful person. And he was, he, at that point, like our relationship was so awful and it was, I just found him so cruel. And I got the text and I actually, I couldn't even, at that point, I just felt like I couldn't trust myself. And I very much would, I, I reached out to a couple of friends and just said like, do what should I do here? Should I go home? Should I, should I find out what's going on? And of course everyone said, yeah, you, your, your son's in the house and, and you need to make sure Jesse's okay. So I went home and I found, I, I made sure that our, our son is named Nicholas and I made sure Nicholas was okay. And I couldn't find Jesse. And so I went into the basement and that's when I did see Jesse and he was uh, in our laundry room and he was hanging from the ceiling by an extension cord. I just remember screaming his name and running to him and at some point calling 911 and uh, it was a very frightening situation. He didn't die at that time. Um, the ambulance, the paramedics came and uh, the police came. I'm not even sure. It's it's uh, interesting when I try and look back. I don't know how much of that was a serious intent and how much was him like just it, the way that he did it was actually the same way that my my friend had passed away. He had hung himself in his parents basement. And so it was um, absolutely devastating. Um, obviously, I was I was so relieved he was OK, but uh, his parents got involved. I called them and they came. They lived several hours away, so they came and he was uh, admitted to the hospital and that's when we decided like our relationship is not working there's no way we can continue this relationship and that's when we decided to separate and it's really fascinating to me because i really i think a lot when i look back and kind of think of you know when i lost jesse i think that was it i think it was that moment and the person i i loved and i married and had a child with and wanted to grow old with i really think when i look back at that point he was gone in my mind and then from then on it was uh really really challenging because then we were trying to to co-parents and uh and he was still struggling all of the the problems he had I was very hopeful that you know maybe the separation and I had taken so much blame at that point I felt like this was all my fault had I not been so difficult his drinking wouldn't have escalated had I not pushed him so hard had I not done this that the other thing uh, which is very common when there's alcohol involved uh, often the partner does take on a lot of that blame and uh, I really was hopeful that if we separate and we kind of have some of our own time to work on ourselves and get healthy I really did hope he would get better Jen, I'm wondering, you mentioned something of you had some wondering about the seriousness of his attempt. And I, and then you were sharing the story of that that was the same way that your friend died. Was there a sense that that was maybe purposeful? That's the, that's the part that's challenging for me because it's hard for me to admit that he could. And this is where I, in my mind, what I do is I, I blame the alcoholism for those actions because I can't imagine the person that I loved 
being that cruel because he knows he knew how much it upset me and, and devastated me um he also he seemed very uh angry about it all he he seemed very upset that i had involved the paramedics and the police and because of because i did that and cas the children's aid society or child protective services here is they they were involved and i don't know i really don't know at the end of the day and i i don't know if his intentions in the moment had actually been to take his life and sometimes when i question it it I, it kind of leads me down a very dark hole so i i'm not sure and i don't i think that's one of those things that i have to accept i'll probably never really know what his intentions were that night it seems like a kind of an underlying foundation of your story and your experience with Jesse is is a lot of those unknowns and those uncertainties, but having to make really clear decisions for yourself and for your son. I'm going back to what you said of the night that that happened and you were at the hospital and the, it sounds like the two of you decided together that this relationship was no longer working and you were going to formally separate at that point. And that idea of losing someone twice. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you wanted to say a little bit more about that because Jesse did... So he survived that in 2017, but then he did die in 2020. And kind of what what was your experience of that saying goodbye and that grief and then the grief when he died? Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting because I really had to, I feel like I had to not think about any of the positive things in our relationship. It was just sort of, I was making this decision to leave the person that I loved. And, you know, I really, again, I, there was so much self blame. It's so painful for me to even think how hard I was on myself at that time. I really just, I felt like I almost had to hate him, but I couldn't, I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not like a angry, hateful person, but in parts of me felt like I have to, I have to not like him or I have to hate him in order to move forward. And in order to, to stick to this, because there were other times where, within that year where we kind of tried to live apart for short periods of time. And then I just, but I, I missed him and I knew like, I, I still loved him. And I, I really, at that point, I had also been told <laughs> that I was toxic for him. So I think part of me was trying to convince myself like this, the best thing for both of us is, is, is to have that separation. Yeah. I think, I think that was the big thing. So he, we separated and my goal was like, I can't remember any of the good things about him. I have to see him as this horrible person because I need to stay away from him. Being together is not healthy for me. It's not healthy for our child. And he was very, very difficult during the next three years. It was almost as though, and I think at this point, again, hindsight, but I think he probably, there was probably brain damage related to the alcoholism and years and years of it. And it, it really escalated after we separated. He, he, every time I turned around, it was like there was a new fire to put out. And there was still, because we were in the process of separating, there was a lot of ties financially and a lot of things I didn't know to do, like freezing, if you have a loan together, making sure it's frozen so that can't they can't take more money out or, you know, things, again, in hindsight, eh, they seem pretty obvious, but at the time you're, you're in such a survival state. So it was three years of, of hell and kind of, like I say, every time I turned around, there was a new fire to put out. Um, he was not really able to work very much. And so I was having to support him, which again, it's, it's really hard to support someone who is trying to make your life hell. Um, and I was paying child support and spousal support and working as hard as I could to support my own, my, my son and my life, uh, while also trying to support him. Then when he, so three years later, when he actually did die, um, so he was admitted to the hospital and it was because of organ failure and within i think it was about two and a half weeks he passed away and once i knew he was actually dying it was like all of the positive stuff that i had shoved down and i didn't want to remember and i didn't want to think about was finally coming up again and resurfacing and being released which i think was actually really healthy because i really did love him and i really did care about him and i just felt like for three years it was like I had bottled it up and I couldn't let it out. And then he died and it was just like, finally, I can actually really grieve the, the beautiful person that I had lost. And again, I felt like I'd lost them in 2017, but physically they were here, their body was here until 2020. So there was something about that next 
transition, that next kind of like step in the loss process that allowed you to remember the Jesse from before. Yeah. Yeah. And it really um, allowed me to, to, to grieve. I think there was sort of this kind of stunted <laughs> process that had happened. And I know there is a grief that everyone goes through when they go through a separation and sort of, you know, I was able to grieve not having, you know, raising our children together and having grandchildren together and kind of having that relationship. And I want, I desperately wanted more, more children and I'm still grieving that. And so I think I was able to grieve those pieces and it was, I was able to grieve the future that I had planned and wanted, but I wasn't able to grieve the past until he actually did pass away. It's interesting because earlier in the conversation, we mentioned the idea of like the context in which we're grieving. And a big part of that is how other people respond to us. And I'm also reminded that you originally reached out to me because you wanted to create an episode that would fill the gap and sort of the knowledge base of what is it like for someone whose ex-partner or ex-spouse has died. So kind of bringing all that together, just how did other people respond to you in your grief? Yeah, so I think there's kind of like three main responses that I had. Um, so one was the people close to me um, that were really concerned about me, and I'll speak more to that. And another was the people that really were concerned about Nick. And then there was sort of a third that really didn't think that I had any reason to grieve because we were separated and I had left him and uh, that wasn't really my place. So. Um, I think speaking about all three of those, the first, so the people that really knew me well knew how much I loved him and cared about him and how hard it was and how devastating it was to leave the person that I had loved. And my family, I would say, would be included in that. And, and my family really hurt when he when he died too. My family, well, my family was there when when my when my best friend died when I was 19. And uh, and then they were there when when Jesse died. And they had been very frustrated by him as well because they knew how much he was hurting me and and how challenging he was and i was literally at one point like i i was walking around with a friend had given me pepper spray because i was worried he jesse was going to kill me and um i changed the locks on my doors and it was it was just i still it's crazy to look back and just um the things that we went through again, he's, then he passed away and he died. And, and I think even for my family, it was sort of all of a sudden, like they were able to remember the good things too. Um, and then I had friends who were, the, who I was close to, who, who again, they really sent flowers and cards and really wanted to make sure I was okay and wondering how I was doing. And then there was sort of the next, next section of people where it, I think for, for a lot of people it's challenging because it's sort of, well, obviously Nick's father had died, but what do we say? How do we talk to someone whose ex has died? And so I think for some people, it's easier to kind of focus more on Nick and say, well, how's Nick doing? And is he doing okay? And, and so, and that was comforting for me in a way too. Like it was a different, different aspect and usually different people I wasn't as close to. And then the third group was more, you know, there were comments about, well, he did it to himself and it was his own fault. And, you know, well, you had left them anyway, so it doesn't matter. And sort of some of those more callous, difficult remarks that uh, that I, I think I had to work through and, and kind of, and I think I was doing some of that to myself as well. So, you know, the whole like disenfranchised grief and, you know, should I really be grieving for the person that I separated from and and on top of the grief was all sorts of, of uh, self-blame and how much of this was my fault that I was working through. Yeah, it's interesting that comments from the third category of folks sound just dismissive across the board, like dismissive that Jesse's life was worth grieving in the first place and dismissive of your role as his ex. So what kind of right do you have to be grieving? It's just really like a complete denial of that being worthy of grief. And I think that's the part that's so sad for me when it comes to addictions and, and suicide where it can so easily overshadow the person's entire life when that's how they pass away and and uh i think those those comments are i still find them really painful because again it's sort of it, it is it's really dismissive of of the human being that jesse was and the grief surrounding it you've mentioned a, a bit about sort of that role that self-blame played throughout the course of kind of the end of your relationship with jesse and then into the grief and 
I feel like self-blame and guilt are best friends. They go around a lot together. <laughs> so I'm wondering kind of what, what your experience with guilt has been and sort of how you've addressed some of the impacts of that guilt. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I think it's a really important topic when it comes to, uh, loss, death by suicide and death by, by addiction. I think I'm one of those people who has just been prone to guilt all my life. And it was just sort of something I would take on and sort of, you know, I, 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 I wanted to fix the problem. And if there was a problem, it was, it's almost in some ways, like it's easier if, if the problem is my, my fault, I can do something and I have some control. And I think that was, it's kind of been the way that I've, I've gotten through much of my life. And I obviously went through some of my own guilt when, when my best friend passed away. I actually had seen him the day before he died. Um, and it was a challenging time because I had moved away from, from him. I moved away to university. And, and so I think I had processed a lot of guilt. And I, I had, I've seen a number of therapists throughout my life. And I did have some therapy to kind of work through that. And, and it was definitely helpful. With, with Jesse, it's, it's so interesting because I think so common for us to look back and think there was all of these things I should have done differently. And I, I agree with that and I accept that. And I, there was definitely things I, sh I wish I had done differently. But I think I've also learned to accept that uh, all human beings are flawed, <laughs> myself included. And sort of that acceptance has really helped me to realize like in hindsight, it's really easy to judge yourself. And I'm really working on not so much focusing on that, but more, really trying to be compassionate towards myself and work on self-compassion and just sort of accepting, like I say, like we are all flawed. There was no way to do that. That situation, the the relationship I was in with him, I was in survival mode for such a long time. And I really do, I think I was doing the best I can. Uh, I could at that time. I definitely, had I been in a better place, could have probably done things better, but I did the best I could. And I think when I try and move forward, it's really more focusing on you know, trying to make sure that I'm continuing to take care of myself and focusing on what I need and learning how to set boundaries and just really trying to work through that piece. The other the other side for me that's been helpful is just holding all that guilt is not going to help anyone. It's not going to help Jesse. It doesn't bring Jesse back. It's also not going to help my son to see that. And I very often, I think, particularly as a child psychologist, um, but just as a mom, I think a lot about role modeling. And, you know, I wouldn't want my son carrying around that guilt. And I, I don't want him to see me carrying around that guilt. And so just kind of recognizing how much more important it is for him to see me living a happy life and being able to grieve Jesse and talk about good memories with Jesse, but also be able to move forward in my life. Well, that brings me to a question about your son and, you know, curious, one, how you talked with him about his dad's death and kind of how the, the early part of supporting him in that was. But also one of the challenges I hear from folks who if it was an ex-partner who died or even if it was a current partner, but the relationship had many layers or complications, trying to figure out like what to share, what not to share with kids and like how did you navigate that? It's so challenging and it's interesting. I, I had a lot of people say, well, you know, thank goodness you're a child psychologist because you'll know what to do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's sort of that like, oh, but I, I don't like I, it's really, really challenging. And I think I, I actually journal a lot. And I remember writing in particular when I when I knew Nick's dad was going to die and I had to break that news to him and I remember journaling like I'm a child psychologist and I have no idea how to do this and uh, it, it's just it's it is so tough. One of the things that I was very fortunate and lucky because I am a child psychologist I was able to reach out to colleagues and kind of get them get their help with sort of walking through I, another question I had was whether or not Nick should go see his dad in the hospital when he was dying and you know it was he hadn't seen it was shortly into COVID, it was only a few months into COVID, and he actually hadn't seen his dad in a few months. And, you know, I, in my mind, I was kind of thinking, is it better for him to see him? And he's, he's probably going to look very ill and might not be able to communicate all that well. Is that better? Or, you know, or, or is it better for him not to? And, and I reached out to a colleague who's a social worker and runs fantastic grief groups. And she kind of helped me walk through that. And in the end, I did. And, you know, I, I think it could have gone either way. But Nick did end up seeing his dad. And um, the other thing I did is there was 
I, I, he was seeing a therapist at the time. He was seeing a social worker as well. Um, I was, and he was, and I think having, again, those supports in place were helpful. And we did attend a grief group, the two of us together. And again, it was COVID, so it was tricky to do any of those kinds of things. Even the, the therapy sessions for him were virtual. You know, he was 11 years old at the time and he has ADHD. So virtual sessions right after, you know, you're going through something traumatic, not ideal, but you know, I think it, it really is about trying to do the best that we could. Uh, the other thing for me, I think there's a lot of pressure that, that people put on themselves. Like I have to do this perfectly, but just knowing that, again, it's sort of that idea of you're doing it the best that you can and you're reaching out and you're, you're asking people and you're getting feedback. And at the end of the day, I was trying to be as stable as I could and, and make those decisions with Nick's best interest in mind. Now that we're a little further out of it, it's been it's been interesting because Nick's been able to talk now. He's 15 now. Um, and I know one of the things we did initially, and this I think was everyone that knew Nick, was kind of shoving down like Nick's, it was just like basically telling Nick, like, your dad was great, your dad was wonderful, your dad was this great, perfect guy. And I think, and it's so often that's the case when someone dies, is you really get focused on the positive things. And it was really good because Nick was actually able to articulate to me, and, and this was pretty early on, that you know, all these people are saying good things and, and talking about good memories, but my memories of my dad aren't so good. And those few years that he did when he was with his dad and, and his dad and I weren't together, his dad was really sick. And his dad, you know, his memories were more dad passing out and me calling you crying. And, you know, they were, they were really difficult. So it was hard for him, for people to be saying all these good things. And then he's kind of like, that's not what I remember. So maybe I'm remembering it wrong. And so because he was able to express that to me, we were able to talk about how we wanted to move forward. And, and what we've done is more, he's well aware his dad was this wonderful person and he doesn't, he really doesn't have very many memories of that. Um, and then we talk about, and because of the illness, he really wasn't making good choices and he wasn't able to be a good dad to you in the end. And we kind of, we talk about it more as the illness taking over and I think that's kind of helped us walk through that a little bit. It's, I mean, it's tricky and I, I don't think there's a perfect way to do it, but that's been how we've been trying to navigate that in more recent years. Uh, I'm just sitting done with the reality of how efforts to protect children can leave them doubting their own experience. Yeah, and so important for them to be able to feel whatever they need to feel, right? And for him, you know, I, I think I've worked so hard with him to sort of, initially he had a lot of guilt, right? And I'm like, of course he does, he's my son. <laughs> so he was full of guilt and I wish I would have spent more time with my dad and especially, you know, the months before he died, I didn't even see him and I didn't want to see him. But again, kind of working through that and, and he's talked about anger and he's talked about some of those different feelings. and. You know, as you know, Jana, that as kids age and they go through different developmental periods, it comes up in different places too. So he, right now, he's a 15 year old boy, does not want to, he, he has a psychologist as a mom who constantly is probing him <laughs> and asking questions, but he does not want to talk about it a whole lot. And so I'll bring it up from time to time, or if there's something that reminds me of his dad, like, you know, good memory, bad memory, whatever, we'll, we'll talk about it, we'll bring it up. I try not to push him too much, but he's, he's very aware if he wants to talk to someone, if he wants to see a therapist, if he wants to talk to me, those, those are always open and that's kind of where we left it. And then usually I'll bring it up um, just if there's a big change coming or something like that, you know, like he graduated from junior high um it's i guess over a year ago now but just kind of walking through that and just acknowledging that you know it's it's too bad that your dad's not here for this and being able to walk through that it's 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 so hard to tread through that because you don't want to make every happy experience sad but i think that's part of the reality too is at least for me you know i think the happiness and the sadness are so closely tied where i'll experience these feelings of joy and, and feeling grateful and, and feeling happy and at the same time feeling a lot of the losses that we've had and we've experienced as a family. The both and of all experiences yes. once grief has uh, taken up residence in our lives. Yeah, and that's, it's, it's interesting too, because I, I think I'm really trying to accept that, that paradox or the both and when it comes to Jesse being this really wonderful, beautiful human being and this great person and the illness creating this very different side of him who was very cruel and very difficult and, and hard 
hard for me to, to live with, to deal with in the end, right? And sort of accepting that both of those things are true and not, you know, it's either he was the most wonderful person in the world or he was a horrible human being. And I think being able to actually accept that he was a beautiful person who got very sick is where I'm landing these days. Jen, I'm curious, you know, with your original hope for this episode to bring some connection, some sense of validation to other folks who are grieving when it's an ex-partner, an ex-spouse who has died. Is there anything else you're thinking of that you're like, gosh, I wish someone had said to me, or I wish I had known this about this experience? I think one of the big reasons I wanted to, to talk to you and talk about this is I find it really challenging to find resources to help with this. And, uh, you know, there's sort of I tried to attend a few grief groups and things like that. And it's often you can be this, you know, you lost your spouse or you lost a friend. Um, There isn't a a category for that. And even joining widow groups. And sometimes it's sort of, well, if you're not in the obituary, then you're, you know, not able to get into the widow group or things like that. And just knowing that there are other people out there and knowing And this is just my experience, right? So not everyone's going to have the same experience, but knowing whatever you feel for that person now is okay. And if you really, you know, want to be able to appreciate the good parts of that person, that's okay. And if you're still kind of in a, in a, in a stage or, you know, maybe that's a more permanent thing where you're so, you're still angry at that person, that's okay too. Right. And I think that's a big piece for me is just learning to accept whatever the emotions are that I'm feeling. And for me, it changes too, depending on, depending on the day, depending on what's going on, but just being able to accept those emotions and, and be okay with it. And, you know, some of the days where the guilt still comes in, being able to feel that guilt, right. But not getting stuck in having to feel that way. And I think, like I said before, like kind of opening up to having multiple truths, right? So yes, you you know, maybe you love that person and they were a wonderful person. And and at the same time, maybe there were some things, some actions, some behaviors that were really awful that you really are, are angry about or are upset about. And it's okay to have both of those things exist. You've mentioned your work as a child psychologist and... I know I can put a lot of pressure on myself as I show up to support other people in their grief. Like I got to have all my stuff together. (laughs) Even when something (laughs) tragic is happening in my life, it's like, oh, put game face on, robot mode activated, like available for listening. And what was it like for you to be in this role as a therapist while you were going through so much turmoil? It's so challenging. (laughs) I think there really is this um, and I, I don't think it's a good thing, but I think often you feel like your clients look up to you and, and sort of see this perfection and you're supposed to be this perfect role model of, you know, pristine mental health and, you know, your life is going smoothly and all of those things. And I remember feeling like the biggest hypocrite at times where it was like, my life is a disaster, but I would be putting on a smile and showing up and, you know, on the outside, it looked like everything was wonderful. And on the inside, it was so, so difficult. I honestly, I, when I look back, I'm not exactly sure how I got through um, some of some of the things I got through. In some ways, I do feel like it almost was helpful. It was sort of like a just kind of an escape from my own life in a way, and just kind of I think it it continued to give me hope, like being able to help other people and. And, you know, I think the work itself for me, I've always been a very driven person. And I think work in a lot of ways is really helpful. It's been interesting now too, because a lot of the talks I'm doing are more focused around grief and self-compassion. And it's it's really interesting. I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day about, you know, whenever I'm doing a talk about self-compassion, it's a reminder to me of all these things I should be working on and should be doing for myself. And so, in some ways it definitely is is challenging and even speaking publicly publicly about this you know i i often worry about being judged and and worry you know that people you know having separated from someone that struggled for mental health issues for the longest time was very worried about other what other people would think but at the end of the day i think i've said this a couple times but just you know all humans are flawed and we all have things that we're working on and you know i think really trying to think of our our values and our morals and trying to stay true to those has been sort of what's been guiding me these these last few years is there a way in which 
this experience has changed how you do your work? I feel like I have such a deep understanding for people going through challenging times and just how difficult that can be. And I think I'm a lot less judgmental than I used to be, probably because of some of the things I've gone through and just not having wanted to be judged uh, during some of my darkest moments. And I think just trying to be more open minded about things. And I think just very much being more compassionate towards others and compassionate towards myself. Like I think I, I really do. For the longest time, I felt that was selfish to really be taking care of ourselves and looking after ourselves. But more and more, the more challenging things I've gone through, the more I've realized that that is so important. And again, I look at I want to role model, model that for my clients, for the people I see, and, and also for my son. Well, Jen, as we come to the end of our conversation, is there any last thing that you're like, ah, oh, if I get off this call, I'm going to really wish I had said? <laughs> yes, I think um, one thing that I think about often is just this idea, because of all the self-blame that's there, and when I catch myself in the self-blame spiral, reminding myself that what happened isn't my fault. And at the same time, it's my responsibility to heal. And I think that's a really important reminder for, for me. Um, another, another place I go to often is a, a quote, and I'm not sure if I'll get it completely accurate, but there's uh, Prentice Hemphill has a quote about the longest relationship you will ever have is your relationship with yourself. And I've really thought about that a lot. And just this idea, again, it kind of ties in the self-compassion, but how much I want to work toward being the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And I feel like I spent a lot of my life very focused on others and keeping others happy and really trying. And when I, when I think of it this way, I'm happier and the relationships around me are actually much healthier. And I, I think just kind of focusing on that has really helped me through. Well, listeners, I feel like you and I have a homework assignment now. Thank you, Jen, for that. <laughs> but again, thank you for um, taking a risk, reaching out to me, sharing your story, and then taking an even bigger risk and being willing to come and share your story in such a public way uh, with me and with our listeners. So really grateful for your, your courage in doing that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. It's, uh, you know, I think has been uh, helpful in my own healing process to be able to talk about it. And I also really did want to thank you, Jenna, for all of the work you do. And like I say, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time now, and I, I really do appreciate all you do to allow people to talk about grief and talk about their stories. Well, Jen, thank you again. And quick, give us a shout out of the name of your podcast in case listeners want to connect with you more. Yes. So the podcast is called The Coping Toolbox, a child psych podcast, and it can be found on all of the, the typical podcast platforms. Great. So The Coping Toolbox, folks, and I will put that in the show notes as always. And listeners, thank you. I say it each and every single time, but I'm really grateful that you're out there tuning in, listening, sharing episodes on the show with people who you think might be helped in some way or, or interested in some way in what we're talking about here. If you want to reach out to me, as Jen did, please please do so. You can email me at griefoutloud at dougie.org and d-o-u-g-y dot o-r-g is also our main website where you can find information about our local programming, uh, programs similar to ours around the world, all of our free downloadable resources, and of course, each and every episode of Grief Out Loud. Excited as always to share that the podcast is sponsored in part by the Chester Stefan Endowment Fund. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCrista Farrow, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us again next time. 